Just wanted to go over a few tips with seeding a new lawn. One thing I see people do is they ignore the seed rate and they think more is better. If you get too much seed down, you'll have increased disease pressure and also inferior color. If you don't get enough seed down, you're likely to get more weed pressure. If you're real mowing, kind of a little bit shorter, I would go kind of on the higher end of the rate. And if you're rotary mowing, I'd try to stay towards the lower end of the rate. I've seen ChatGPT recommend the full seed rate for an overseed, but I would either not overseed at all. Like if you have good density, you don't need to overseed. If your genetics are good, you got good density, you got no reason to put down more seed. If I do overseed, I usually just do it once, six months after the initial seeding, and I would do my seed rate around a third of the full seed rate. Half at the most, or if you're doing off-season overseeding, like into Bermuda or something, you can do pretty high seed rates for that. In general, stick to the seed rate recommended. It's there for a reason. Fertilizer, I would avoid phosphorus and potassium, especially potassium. Uh, believe it or not, even for a new lawn, you don't need phosphorus. It might buy you about three days sometimes. Ultimately, it ends up settling in the same place. And unfortunately, you have that phosphorus in your soil, you know, increasing your salts without giving you any benefit for all the years that it stays there. So you're getting yourself three days faster establishment and then probably slightly inferior turf quality. Scott's 3204 fertilizer is a great low potassium, no phosphorus fertilizer that has nice pearl size. Nice pearl size means more even color, a more even application. So I really like that Scott's 3204. What I personally use is urea dissolved in water, which is usually about three to four times cheaper. Another thing I see people do, they won't continue their fertilizing. A newly established lawn just needs more fertilizer for a while. Basically, if the sun's out, if it's growing, it needs to get fertilizer pretty regularly. And I mean like every four to eight weeks. ABG might need to do a little more heath thatching and such. And even with rye, if you see any spots that look a little off, you might want to consider raking them and just look to see if there's any debris um, in there. Aeration, I don't think you have to do that. Um, it would be a good idea to get rid of any thatch if you do have some. One big mistake people do is they'll spray glyphosate on dormant grass. So if they're planning on doing a fully renovated lawn, like look at these lawns here. So that one's dormant. They're kind of green, but you want it green. Ideally watered and fed. So the faster it's growing, the faster it's dying. If it's dormant, it's not dying at all. So definitely get some water in the ground before you spray glyphosate if you're doing a full renovation. And then I like to do high rate glyphosate. I don't mess around with 1% concentration of glyphosate. I'm doing the max label rate for kill on a lawn. I wanna say it's like seven or eight ounces for the 41% concentration. But yeah, you can get glyphosate, two and a half gallon concentrate, about a hundred bucks at a co-op for two and a half gallons. So that'll last you a long time. It's a lot more economical than buying a little quart of it or something for, you know, say 30, 40 bucks. So consider getting the two and a half gallon at the co-op. You're not really gonna find a more effective or safer herbicide. And I like to get the herbicide down as early as possible, ideally more than a month in advance. This renovation here, I only had the glyphosate on the ground two weeks, or not even two weeks, I think 10 days before I torched it. So you can do less, but I do like to do high rate glyphosate on a green lawn and then you'll you'll get a fast kill that way, especially when it's uh, fall seeding versus uh, spring. The temperatures can just be kind of too low. The soil can have the grass growing kind of sluggish. You don't really need to do a soil test in all likelihood, but if your pH is crazy, like if you're in a desert or something, you might want to just have ammonium sulfate as your only nitrogen source. Your pH has to be pretty messed up for pH adjustment to be very promising. If you do happen to have a good quality soil test like ALIC-3 Waypoint Analytical, if your sulfur is below 10 parts per million, I would probably apply a pound of gypsum per thousand square feet. I generally recommend not messing with the dirt. You can chew it up with like a dethatcher, use a leveling rake, kind of move it around. But I would try to work with your existing dirt. You can have a good lawn on almost any soil and if you do swap dirt, I wouldn't do any more compost than about a three-way. So just a third compost max, and I'd prefer probably none, just topsoil. If you do want better drainage, it's gonna be higher maintenance, but you can do sand. In my opinion, it's kind of nice to have moderate drainage. So I want the water to stick around a little bit. Nice to have a little bit of silt in the soil. It can be clay or silt, but you don't want it to be all clay. That's the one situation maybe I would, I probably would swap out all clay because uh, it's just harder to keep it wet. And then if it does dry out, it's hard to get wet again. It can get pretty hydrophobic. 
I wouldn't say clay is really desirable, but a little clay I wouldn't mind. It'd be totally fine with me. I don't like compost much because I'd rather have higher quality carbon from root cycling. Compost, a lot of it is really low quality. Sticks, blackberry grindings, pumpkin seeds. You're just asking for some mushrooms for quite a while. Grass family, if you want easy, I'd say tall fescues are hard to beat, especially high mode tall fescue. Perennial rye, if you can have it in your area, you know, as long as you don't have too crazy disease pressure, um, you might be able to have rye, but yeah, I've got a grass seed company, Seed Boss. I think I have the best rye. I'm working on fescues right now. That data analysis actually is going very well. I think I will have it done in the not too distant future. I, I don't know if I'll have the best fescues, but I, I was able to have what I think is the best perennial rye out there. Seed-boss.com if you're interested in grass seed. Fescues probably won't be available until late August and everything's going to be shipping about that time as well, hopefully, uh, as soon as harvest gets back. I don't have full control over when seed gets in, but I've got um, pallets ordered and when they're in, they're in, it'll start shipping. Groundskeeper 2 rake just works really well for raking in seed. You can get that at Home Depot. Now on bare dirt, I do peat moss. On overseeding, I don't top dress with anything. So I don't do any peat moss or compost or anything like that if I'm overseeding. This I overseeded in 20 minutes. I threw three pounds of seed per thousand square feet for rye, which is about a third of the kind of higher end of the seed rate. And I raked it in. I was back inside in 20 minutes and I think I watered it twice. Oh, another thing with watering. So watering three to four times a day, you know, what everyone recommends is optional. You don't have to do that. So I water rye once a day. Every once in a while I water it twice, but really it could be watered every other day. So there is a study that is every other day at 60% reference evapotranspiration and rye still germinated the same as if it was watered more. Kentucky bluegrass, you do have to go closer to 100% evapotranspiration. In the study they did 60 and they did 120 and bluegrass germinated a lot better you know, with more water and it obviously takes longer to germinate bluegrass. So with bluegrass, you might want to seed that earlier. With any other grass family, you can seed a little later. Germination 45 days before average first frost, that's you don't have to adhere to that in a more mild area. Like if you've got more mild winters. On my last renovation years ago, I had the seed germinating seven days before average first frost. It all survived. It was good. One thing I would try to avoid is downpour in your forecast. Bluegrass, you know, that could take two weeks to germinate, even with a fall seeding. In my area, I could do rye kind of up to about late October, and I wouldn't choose to do that. But this, this lawn here, I, I seeded at September 20th really happy with the results and I think that's going to be an ideal seeding window in a lot of areas maybe mid-September uh, but not not a lot earlier than that I would say I, I prefer to have some natural rain if it's dumping buckets whenever it might dump buckets I would try to get it germinated you know maybe a week before that or maybe two weeks before that for KBG something like that any timing related to seed I want the soil warm but not hot enough for fungus but i prefer to not have downpour risk is the thing i care more about if you do have a slope there is a product you can get it at costco kirkland plant-based dish soap i did a short a while back and i tested a handful of products i intentionally compacted soil into cups and i tried various detergents from around the house a wetting agent i had it was vivax and i tried a few fertilizers actually the fertilizer held water so that is just probably why salt generally increases disease it would be a a good theory behind that and it also would probably reduce the water potential into the plant and kind of hinder mass flow uh, but in terms of getting increased percolation that Kirkland plant-based dish soap pretty drastically outperformed everything else one was Dawn and actually slowed percolation down quite a bit and was laundry detergent that slowed percolation down 5x the wetting agent slowed percolation down but the only one that increased it was Kirkland plant-based dish soap so that should be a layer of washout insurance if you're on a slope you can also do things like seeding blankets if you're on a real extreme slope in general i would just avoid downpour risk totally if you can just by when you seed and then ideally if you are on a slope you're going to have to turn your irrigation to cycle it on and off a few times you want to allow time for percolation because runoff will happen really quick on a slope i'd be trying to get about 0.1 to 0.15 inches in the ground per day during a seeding depending on what grass family you should be at around probably 75% of evapotranspiration, reference evapotranspiration. And if you comment your area, I can send you a custom link to an evapotranspiration map that's specific to your area and up to date. So you can refresh it and it'll tell you the water loss for the week, but it's designed for uh, agriculture, not horticulture. So you will have to convert it to, to grass by multiplying it by whatever your crop coefficient is, which I can kind of give you an idea what you probably want. I would need your city, your grass type you're planning to do, and then your ideal height of cut. I'll just be estimating your crop coefficient and giving you a map specific to your area. That watering works pretty well during establishment and it also works well during 
um, maintenance. So I'm watering this at about 75% reference evapotranspiration. And that sounds fancy, but it's really not all that hard. I would recommend covering bare dirt seeding with peat moss. I do 50% overlapping passes out of a Lanzi peat moss spreader pass and then 50% overlapping passes from there. And then up against fences, I kind of throw the roller like this just to kind of throw some peat moss, make sure I get right up against the fence. So I might be a little too much peat right up against the fence, not a big deal, but I want to just make sure there's some peat covering everything. And that just keeps birds off and it should increase germination rate just a little bit. Peat moss, it's worth considering not doing that, especially if you have irrigation. It could protect the ground from getting pounded with rain. If there's enough of a downpour with a slope on bare dirt, that peat moss is going to dance away. It'll float, it protects things a little bit and also keeps birds off, which just can be a little annoying. If you have one bird or two birds or five birds, it's not a huge deal, but if there's 20 of them, and they're just eating seeds all day, you know, it might actually make a dent in your seed rate. Peat moss, only on bare dirt seeding. And with overseeding, I am just raking it in, no prep at all. Um, the only thing I would prep is to avoid thatch. But I would uh, chew up the dirt, push around a leveling rake, throw seed, and rake it in. And I like to pull a dethatcher backwards, throw seed into the rows, kind of like you're planting corn. And if I'm really trying to prep an overseed, I'll do that too, but I've had just as good of success just throwing seed, no, over, no prep at all. And with a groundskeeper two rake, heavy pressure, no peat moss or anything. I barely even watered it and it all germinated great. That was the last overseed I did. So I was like, why overcomplicate it if the results are good? I would recommend miso trione. It can depend on grass family, but I think it's up to 4.1 grams per thousand square feet. So I'm usually doing like three and a half grams per thousand square feet. And on bare dirt seeding, that's a little more important because you're watering intentionally trying to get the grass to germinate. So any weed seeds that are in there will germinate as well. So that's why it's a good idea to have some tenacity because there's nothing, there's no competition for those new weeds while the grass is germinating. Grass family selection, depending on what your standards are, I would start going more towards fescues if I want a lawn to be easy. I'm gonna start going towards rye and KBG if I want a grass to be pretty. But in general, I'm gonna, it's the decision is usually going to be between rye and fescue for me, but but I might consider KBG in certain situations. But just keep in mind, you'll have to maintain KBG more with thatch and things like that. It's, it can be a little higher maintenance and rye can be kind of high maintenance, not the, really the way I do it. But but I have been trying this year. I've been watering fairly close to the ideal, been fertilizing pretty well. This is a newer lawn. Hopefully I have addressed most of the errors and random hearsay and corrected some of the things like watering three to four times a day optional as long as you get the right amount of water in the ground that's all that matters you also don't want your seed to float away so that can mean watering and waiting water and wait but if if you're doing a bigger area especially you can probably just get all the water down in one watering if you want to as long as the ground is damp to the touch if it's damp to the touch i don't water if it's uh, you know, starting to feel a little dry, that's when I'm about to water. I wouldn't call it a mistake, but everyone wants to aerate as if you have to do that. Uh, it's not really gonna do much good for you. You can do it, but should you? No, probably not. This right here is Mystique perennial ryegrass. Now, just because this is Mystique doesn't mean that's what I would seed. I would have seeded in my area, I would have seeded podium blend. I'll uh, try to get my fescues out, seed-boss.com. You can see NTEP performance summaries, but in my opinion, a lot more user-friendly than NTEP. The ones that are dark green, that's top 10 performance. Light green is top 25th percentile yellow. On my uh, NTEP uh, performance summaries is middle 50th percentile and red. Not much of that makes it to the market usually, but red is bottom 25%. In general, you wanna pick your grass seed based on turf quality. Turf quality has things like disease, density, color, leaf texture. It has everything all in one metric. So turf quality is the metric you want to really zoom in on an NTIP. And then when you're look, shopping for things like color, pay attention to the least statistical difference. So the least statistical difference, you'll see that on NTIP, that is the threshold of 95% confidence. So as soon as you get that gap, you've got 95% confidence. So just as an example, fireball and hat trick in my area, rated a 7.7 .7 for color on NTEP. Now, cultivars I like, this one here was 7.3 out of uh, 9, and the least statistical difference was 0.6 in the Oregon location, which is kind of the reference for my area. So the gap between hat trick and fireball and what I planted is only 0.4. They are 95% confident that hat trick and fireball are darker when the gap of 0.6 exists. So they might be 60% confident that hat trick and fireball are darker than what I 
planted, but they're not statistically confident. That is just an arbitrary number that makes it scientifically acceptable to be able to say, yeah, that's better than that, even though it's not guaranteed that it is. That least statistical difference, you are better getting a gap of any amount. It is technically still more likely to be darker, but pay attention to quality and look at the least statistical difference on that. Keep in mind, quality covers everything. You're basically getting better grass when you shop based on quality. I wouldn't be shopping based on color. You probably won't even be able to see the difference with color. Try to watch other videos if you want to bump my channel up a little bit and uh, check out seed-boss.com for rye and I'll try to have fescue on the shelf as soon as I can and it's going well.